Now it's time for Moneybox Live with Leslie Kerwin. Hello, good afternoon. Should every citizen be paid a basic income by the government? £3,700 a year for those of working age, tax-free, regardless of other income and regardless of whether you work or not. This radical idea, known as the citizen's income or universal basic income, could potentially rewrite our financial lives. It's the subject of hot debate in various parts of the world right now. Experiments are being planned in the Netherlands and in Finland to see how some form of basic income might work. Its supporters here in Britain argue the advantages would be that it would largely replace our complex, means-tested benefit system, with the exception of housing and disability benefits. It would give people a small, secure income, make it easier to increase hours of work without penalties, and allow carers to take time off or career breaks. The level it might be set at is critical. Too low and it won't be a proper safety net. Too high and it could discourage people from going to work. Critics argue such a scheme could actually penalise the lowest paid in society. And they say there's a risk it could be so expensive it would lead to soaring tax levels for those people who do work. We'll explain more about how it might work in a minute, but we want to hear your questions and your comments. Call us on Moneybox Live to have your say. 03 700 100 444. The lines are open right now. Do you think a basic income from the government would help you in your situation? Is it a fair way to distribute money from the taxes that people pay? Joining me is Dr Malcolm Torrey, who is the director of the Citizens Income Trust, and he's been working on this idea for, what, about 30 years? Yes, that's right. What is the basic aim of this? Uh, the, the, well, there are several basic aims. One is that it wouldn't be uh, withdrawn from you as your earnings rose. At the moment, means tested benefits are withdrawn as earnings rise, and so many people get very little uh, additional disposable income if their uh, wages go up. Um, uh, So um, that's a major advantage of a citizen's or basic income. Another is it will create a secure financial platform on which everybody can build. At the moment, we have no such secure platform except for child benefit for families with children. And that's a very valuable uh, platform for lots of families. And a citizen's income to adults would have the same effect. A citizen's income would create social cohesion that we don't now have. How would it do that? Because everybody would get it. At the moment, we are divided into taxpayers and into benefits recipients. A citizen's income will go to absolutely everybody, like the NHS. It's something that that involves all of us, and we all of us make use of it and benefit from it. A citizen's income would be very like the NHS in that respect. And it would replace most of the current welfare system. That depends on the scheme. There are schemes that do, and there are schemes that don't. The important thing is to have a genuine citizen's income that's unconditional, that doesn't change whatever your personal circumstances, whatever your earnings, whatever your assets, whatever anything else. That's what matters. Okay. Well, a year-long study into basic income was carried out by the Royal Society of Arts and Anthony Painter, who's its Director of Policy and Strategy, is here. Now, you looked at this. Why did you decide to support this idea? Um, The RSA is very interested in how people can reach their creative potential. Um, And an important part of that is that people have fundamental security in their lives. Um, In fact, earlier on this week, the Prime Minister said that the key to improving life chances was security for families. Um, And so straight away, you're looking at the welfare system when you're thinking about security. Um, And that that is why we started having a look at the the basic income. We came to the conclusion that um, it provides fundamental security is simple so people can understand it doesn't distort um, their preferences when it comes to work and it gives them freedom to choose between work self-employment caring responsibilities if that's what they have or to learn to improve their lives okay well let's talk about how much we might individually each get paid there are different models and we can't go through all of them obviously it would be too complicated under your scheme, how much money would we get? Because it, it breaks down, doesn't it, into what children would get, what adults would get and what pensioners would get. Yeah, there's a variety of different levels. Children under five, the first born will get £4,200 a year, paid to the parents, of course. Um, the second born and, and later children will get 3300 and £2,900 for those over the age of five. Um, and for adults over the age of 25, it would be 3600 or so. And for pensioners, as they get now, about £7,400. These are 2012 to 13 figures, so they might not quite match what people are getting in the current time. 
And how did you reach those amounts? Um, we looked at the Citizens Income uh, Trust model. Uh, we looked at the current benefit system uh, and we replicated them into a basic income system, which ha- has this non withdrawal element. So it gives people this sort of fundamental foundation. What's most important... So it's supposed to match up really with the kind of benefit levels that people are already being paid. Is that right? Uh, yes, but it works differently because it gives them this fundamental foundation. So it gives them this greater level of security than the current system offers. Okay. And Malcolm, you've got different levels of payment, haven't you? We don't want to go into huge amounts of detail, but no. the, they are basically, what, a bit lower than the RSA? Well, um, we, 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 have, we have researched different schemes at the Institute for Social and Economic Research at the University of Essex. And uh, we have discovered that a, a scheme at the level that the RSA report suggests would unfortunately create some gains, some losses amongst low-income households, um, which we knew about. And so we've costed a different scheme. It has a lower citizen's income, though it's a real citizen's income of £54. And That's £54 a week. A week, £54 a week. Um, and, and that doesn't create the same kind. There are, very few, there are a few losses still for households at different points along the earnings range, but there are far fewer losses and they're very small. Um, and it has the, the other advantage that it leaves the means tested benefit system in place, but simply recalculates everybody's means tested benefits downwards, so, which, which takes a lot of people off them. So just give me, for example, how much a working age adult will get under your scheme. £54 for the citizen's income. They would then have that deducted from any means tested benefits or what ta- uh, that they were uh, they were getting. They'd be recalculated. Okay. Well, we'll be talking about people who might possibly lose out on, on low incomes. I want to talk about winners and losers. Uh, Professor Donald Hirsch re- produced a report for the Joseph Rowntree Foundation about this. Uh, he's from Loughborough University, where he is the director of the Centre for Research in Social Policy. Um, uh, Donald, in your view, who are the winners and the losers here? I think the big winners are bound to be. Um, families with children who are working on on low incomes because at the moment they've got quite significant entitlements which get withdrawn quite quickly Um, and if you don't withdraw them then they'll they'll retain more income as, as their earnings go up. You have to pay for this somehow, there's lots of different ways of designing how you pay for it and it's important to understand that somebody has to pay for it. One option um, is that you simply create a higher tax rate um, and that's probably going to... A higher hit, tax rate for everybody, for everybody. who's working. Yes, you, you, you just raise the basic tax rate. And, and if, you just do, if you want to pay for it just through that, it, it might have to go up a lot, so sort of 40 or 50% potentially. Now that's going to hit... 40 or 50% for the basic rate of tax. Yes, and that's going to obviously hit people who, who are on high incomes, but it will also um, hit some people who, who are single and have a, less, a lower starting entitlement on lower incomes. Um, and you can also pay for it in other ways. And some of these schemes sort of suggest other things that you might do, such as, um, su- such as um, abolish um, higher rate tax relief on pensions. But you have to then ask, well, what could the quite large amounts raised for that be spent on other than just giving money to everybody. So there, there, it, it isn't an easy solution. No, and if we're talking about who might lose out, I mean, we, we heard a bit earlier that it's possible that on some schemes, the, the very lowest people on the lowest incomes could lose out quite a lot. Well, one thing that this doesn't do is to give anything more to people who are the very poorest, who are the people who are not working, because because there's no proposal to raise that basic sort of income support. And so, um, but the, but the people who lose most on low incomes who are working are, are going to be single people because their their entitlements will 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 not be as high. And so, the, the fact they're paying more tax will hit them sooner. Anthony, how, how do you answer that? That under your scheme, you know, some of the the poorest could lose out. Um, well, they won't lose out in the sense that what it does is take them out of the current system whereby um, they are sort of, they oscillate between uh, an intrusive welfare state and very difficult and low paid work. So there is a gain in terms of their lives and control over their lives. Um, there will be some uh, losers, but they will be tend to be those um, who spend a long time on very low hours at the bottom end of the income st- scale. The reality is that's a very dynamic part of the labour market. So people are moving in and out of income all the time. And especially when you have the national living wage in place, which we will have, um, that will help ensure that any losses are compensated for. OK, let's talk to Will Hadwin from the charity Working Families. Will, what's your response to the ideas we've heard so far? 
Well, in general, working families would welcome a citizen's income mostly because of the effect of conditionality on parents and carers. What what does that actually mean? Well, in the current system, and even more so under universal credit, most claimants will be required to do something in order to get their benefit. And depending on your circumstances, until you reach a certain earnings threshold, you're still required to look for work, even if you're in work. So you need to increase your hours or increase your wages. And we don't know yet exactly what impact that's going to have because it hasn't fully been brought in. But what we hear so far is parents being told, no, you can't look for the job that you want, that you think will fit in with your family responsibilities. You have to take this job, which is a zero hours contract or which might end after six months. With a student income, actually, there'd be an incentive to do that because you would know that you could do it for a bit, come back. You would have that safety net, which you don't currently have because you Claiming benefit, again, takes time, administration. People often go for quite a long time, weeks, without money. OK, well, let's talk to Graham, who's on the line from Merseyside. Uh, Graham, uh, is any of this ringing bells with you? Uh, yes, it is. It is. Uh, I mean, the, 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 the problem with being on benefits and, and having them cut off or having a taper on them when you, get into, when you, get, when you find work is that you, you have to have well-paid month, uh, well-paid work in order for it to be worth going to work. And what's your experience? Well, I, I, I mean, I do temporary work, so I'm in work and out of work and in work and out of work. Um, and it can be, it can be quite difficult claiming benefits on that sort of, on that sort of basis because it does take time for the benefits to claim through, for the housing benefit to come through, for the job seeker allowance to come through. They all come at different times and they're all different levels and, and, Things stop and things start at, at strange times, and it, it, having a constant income would mean that y- you don't have to worry about all the, the the time you have to spend waiting for your, your, your benefits to come through. You can just get in work, uh, and and it's it's all sorted if you know what I mean. Uh, lots of people nodding here. And so, how much do you think it would change your life? It means that I'd be able to manage my money better because I'd know what's coming in, I'd know what's going out, and, and I'd know what commitments I was able to keep. And Do you know what I mean? I'd know what I'd be able to commit to, that sort of thing. Um, and it means that I'd probably be able to take work that I wouldn't ordinarily take um, because it'd be worth my while to do so. Anthony Painter, anything you, you want to say to Graham? I think... Graham's um, life is going to become more and more typical of the world of work. It's changing. There are almost as many self-employed people as those in public sector work now. So working lives are changing. We're doing far more sort of a different, a variety of different jobs in and out of work. And that's only going to increase, not reduce. So even though you know, Graham's had a, you know, a difficult time in and out of work, the fact is that far more of us are going to be facing those sorts of challenges over the next 5, 10, 15 years. Graham, thanks very much indeed for your call. Uh, Donald Hirsch. What's your response to that? I I think that's a very good point and a very good aspiration that people shouldn't sort of be messed around as they go in and out of work. Um, There is more... There are more ways to do this than simply giving a flat rate payment to everybody. The universal credit was originally meant to be doing this, and it will help combine benefits and mean you don't have to keep on going back and forth into in and out of work. But unfortunately, these things tend to get undermined by politics. And in this case, um, there's been a cut in in already in the amount that you can earn on universal credit before you have to start declaring it. So you can do these things if you really want to, but that's not the same as saying that everybody, a millionaire and a pauper, should, should all get the same flat rate payment. And just uh, talking about winners and losers, Jane from Liverpool is saying that uh, she doesn't understand... Oh, she's on the line, Jane. (laughs) Jane, you can say to me what you were going to say. Hello. Hello this is. I'm no um, expert on this, but just using common sense, um, it it worries me that these so-called experts could possibly propose a system where you give extra money from the common purse. You give extra money to people, no matter how wealthy they are, and there are some seriously wealthy people, and you disadvantage, you take away from some of the poorest people. Um, Jane, Jane, I'm going to put your question straight away to Malcolm, who has been thinking about this for such a long time. Malcolm, Mm. what's the answer to that? The answer to that is that it's... The citizen's income is extremely simple to administer. That does mean that everybody gets it. Yes, it does. But the wealthy are paying far more in tax than they will be receiving in their citizen's income. So it's no problem 
that they receive a citizen's income as well. That answers the first point. It's rather like the argument that goes on sometimes about the winter fuel allowance now, which goes to every pensioner. Um, we hear people, I, I've heard people on your programme uh, say this, that, that the rich shouldn't get it. It's, it will be much more complicated for the rich not to get it because you would need to means test it. Whereas if you give it to everybody, then that's very simple. There's no stigma attached to it. Everybody gets it. The poor get it and the rich get it. And the rich are paying far more in tax than they're getting in their winter fuel allowance. Therefore, it's the same argument applies to citizens' income. Everybody would get it. Um, yes, the rich would get it too. And that's not a problem. And in answer to the second part of the question, there are schemes that reduced almost zero the losses that anybody would face. And it, it partly depends on how much additional money a government is willing to put into a citizen's income scheme. It's possible to fund a scheme from within the current benefits and tax system, or it's well, possible to pay additional money to do that. We'll, we'll talk more about that in a minute, but Jane, are you convinced by that? No, I'm not convinced by that. I think he's, he's um, very good at um, talking the talk, but um, I think if, if you actually come to somewhere like Liverpool, where I'm, I'm speaking from, or many other places, and you actually see the reality of... of life just to simplify something doesn't mean that it's better okay you know we haven't got time to go into it because no i'm not convinced at all we haven't but thanks very much indeed for your call jane um let me talk about the cost of the country now the argument is of course that you're streamlining most of the existing benefits you're wiping a lot out uh, a lot of means testing a lot of administration but uh would it still cost more at present now anthony painter of the rsa you admit it would quite a lot more um, our, our, our model is uh, effectively, yes, it will cost 1% more of, of GDP. Now, this is not unprecedented in historical But we're terms. talking about, if you use 2014 figures, it's roughly £18 billion. Pounds. Um, indeed, but we think the benefits are so significant in terms of changing the fundamental basis of life. Um, that Wh where's is, that going to come from? Um, well, I mean, the, a variety of places. I mean, you, that would be a decision for the implementing government at the time. Now, it might be that you transition to it over a period of time, as we did with tax credits in the 2000s. So if you had a period of growth, you could fund some of it from that. You could fund some of it by um, taking, clawing a little back from some of the big winners um, of the system. In our system, and to come, come back to the point on redistribution, on our system, we would charge the very richest more. So that answers Jane, Jane's point about the fairness question here, because we were put in a additional rate in for those um, earning 150,000 or more. OK, Donald Hirsch, how yeah. big is that figure of 18 billion? Can you put it into context yeah. for us? Well, you, you could do a lot more, more with it or you could do different things with it, which would do quite a lot. For example, if you wanted to focus not on giving people um, everybody a flat rate income, but trying to reduce the costs which a lot of people face, you could make childcare free and you could make social care free and you could increase significantly um, the amount that you pay to the poorest um, on job seekers allowance and still have change out of that. But that I mean, would these, be these targeted are big amounts. and means tested. It would, yeah, so well, some of it would be targeted, some of it would be about delivering services. And I think that in this country, we have tended to have more support for things which are universal and delivered as a service, such as free education and free health care. And if you wanted to extend that to free child care, um, and and free elder care, um, I think that would actually have a lot more support as a universal thing than giving free money. And if, if you had to pay for it just through tax, how much would taxes possibly have to rise to pay for that? Well, as we've heard, there are lots of different schemes, but um, it... It, you have to take into account those extra taxes um, and, and it could be anything in, on, on one of Malcolm's figures. It, it comes to well over 50 percent um, of all income being paid in tax with no tax allowances. And I think that even though it's true that, 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 that there are swings and roundabouts for older people, people don't like seeing high basic rates of tax. Um, it, it, they don't like to think that everybody must lose 50% of, of everything that they earn. That's, that's not a popular idea. Malcolm, let me come back to you on, mm. on those figures. There are different ways of funding it. Uh, the two schemes that we published recently, um, we, we remove people's personal tax allowances and that's how it's largely paid for because you're giving people a cash payment instead of them. Um, and then we find that for the scheme that's at the level that the RSA report suggests, then income tax only needs to rise by 5%. Only 5%? Um, yeah, only 5%. Uh, but it's still a bit high. And we, we, one of the reasons for proposing scheme B, which, which is a lower figure of 54%, is it's 
the, the rise in income tax is only about 3%. Now, we've seen but, but gyrations will, in income tax rates. Will, will politicians support massive increases in tax? Not, I mean, even massive, 5% no, is, is a lot. 5% is not something we'd recommend, and it's unlikely to be politically feasible. 3% might be possible for such an mm. For such an advantageous system. Except it wouldn't be so advantageous because in order to do that, you'd take a lot of the advantages out by still having, having means testing, which is exactly what you want to get rid of. So would you, you would have to have means testing, there would, would you, be you restricted testing, the tax one rises? The, one of the most um, recent research, pieces of research that we've done at the Institute for Social and Economic Research using their micro simulation software, um, is it would show that a lot of people would would first of all, a lot of people come off means tested benefits because all of their means tested benefits will have been calculated downwards because they'll have a citizen's income. And a lot of families will find themselves within £30 of coming off means tested benefits and might choose to do so. OK, let's go to Will. Will I also think it partially answers Jane's question because it means that those people in Liverpool, they're not going to get any less money than they get now. So... It, it, to answer her question, it doesn't penalise those people because you would get your means-tested benefits on top if you needed to. OK, Anthony Painter, I haven't been back to you and people have said a lot of things about your scheme. What's your reaction to all those uh, thoughts about I, I the figures? I don't recognise the 50% figure. I mean, essentially what we're saying is that um, government expenditure will go from 36 to 37% of GDP. Well, that is not a seismic shift in any, in any way, shape or form. It, it's completely um, historically grounded. The choices that chances make all the time. I mean, we're, we're essentially told that these things are impossible until suddenly a chancellor comes along and makes a decision. So take, for example, a national living wage. Who would have thought that George Osborne would go for that um, in the budget as he did last year? But suddenly the impossible became possible. OK, but... Is there any major political party at the moment that is supporting this idea? Uh, in in the UK, not as yet, um, but Fianna Fáil in Ireland um, is looking at it. The governing party in Finland is looking at it. So increasingly there is a global debate and parties of, of the centre, the left and even some of the right are looking at this seriously. Well, th- there has been a lot of media excitement over it, hasn't there? But uh, are these, these projects overseas comparable to the UK, helpful to, to the UK? Um, I think that there isn't anything which is really comparable to the idea of giving every citizen um, a, 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 an amount, a payment which is funded through taxation. I mean, Alaska, which is often often quoted, gives a thousand dollars or so to people from a fund which ca- which which was contributed by the oil companies, and I think we're kind of that ship has sailed for us with North Sea oil. Um, it's not the same as saying that you're going to give something which is equivalent to benefits to people. And a lot of the um, European ones you've talked about have got very sensible ideas and experiments of the kind we were talking about earlier, where you sort of make um, the the switch from into out of work benefits um, um, more fluid and actually could create more tolerance for that. That isn't the same as giving a citizen's income to everybody. And any suggestions from you um, about, from Anthony Painter, about uh, how these projects overseas might actually work into what's happening in the UK? I think we've just got to watch it very closely. Um, the experiment in Utrecht and Netherlands is going to be interesting. The Finnish government is looking at the feasibility to have a trial. And one of our recommendations is, you know, don't take our word for it. Let's look at what a, at a trial in the UK to see how this works in practice. Um, and I think what we're going to see increasingly over the next few years is some real world data of comparable um, welfare systems to our own trying out something a basic income type system but in in utrecht uh, they're focusing really on people who are already receiving benefits are yeah. they they're not looking at the population as a whole having a basic income no but it's but but when you have a trial you've got to start somewhere and you've got to choose a particular group and that's a particular group that's affected and it's easy to to, to monitor and test um, and that's that's what they're doing now and if it works at that level then you think about expanding it wider and, and in Finland, they're only looking at, at how they might actually uh, launch a kind of basic income study. And it could be 2017 or 2018 before they do it, they tell us. Yeah. And uh, so it's all some way off, isn't it? It's it's a, a big change and it requires very deep thought, very good design. Um, and so I'm very reassured that no one's rushing into it because we've got to get it right when we try it. Uh, Malcolm Torrey. Uh, the only genuine citizens income pilot projects that we've seen around the world so far have been one in Namibia and one in India, which are very different countries from ours. And one of the reasons it'd be lovely to have a real pilot project here was to find out what happened in a developed country. In Namibia, they found that there was considerable increase in people's own account economic activity when they were given citizens' incomes. Very positive result. Be nice to see the same here. Donald? Um, Could I just say that I agree that all this is, is quite a long way off, but in moving towards it, it's not just a matter of working out the practicalities. It's also about getting over two 
incredibly big political things we haven't talked much about. The first one is an acceptance that people can get income which they can live on without having any requirement at all. And many of us regret the fact that um, support for payment of benefits, even in our very conditional system, has been eroded and weakening rather than the reverse over, over, over the last few years. And it would be a, a really big change to convince people that because it's somehow something which everybody gets, that you can get it without having to do anything. The other, the other is, I think it would require higher marginal tax rates. The last person who who raised income tax in this country openly was, guess who, Dennis Healy in 1975. I think we have, we, we don't actually think in those terms anymore. And it would be a big change. It would require an enormous shift, mind shift in the, in the way we think about politics and the role of government for people to be supportive of this if they realise what it actually means, which is something that has to be paid for and something that's unconditional. Well, you're talking about people's response to the idea. Let's yeah. give a roundup of, of some of your responses from the audience on, on Twitter. Michael says, I think the basic income would be very good for families as women could take more time off work after the birth to raise the child. But I'm concerned a larger than normal fraction of society would be happy not to work. Jason says there's a lot of sense in the idea. Think how many civil servants we could save. IDS would have no job either. Uh, Irene says, no too many freebies are already handed out working for your money brings satisfaction value and pride Malcolm, your response to those responses um, One response to that is that a citizen's income would mean it would be much more likely that people would look for work if they didn't have it or that they would increase their income if they did have it. Because at the moment, if you're on tax credits or means tested benefits and you increase your earnings, then you get very little additional disposable income out of that. With a citizen's income, the citizen's income would not fall um, if your earnings increased. So a citizen's income of any level would have a positive effect for people in the lower earnings ranges. Will Hadwin. I would just like to make the point that at the moment we're about as far from this as we can possibly be. We're going to see increased conditionality under universal credit. I wouldn't want people to get Universal credit was supposed to streamline benefits and was supposed it to make it easier does, to go between it, work and benefits. It, it may make it easier to go between work and benefits in the sense of getting your money back more quickly if you come out of work. But in the sense of incentives, that's been undermined because of the cut to the work allowances. And conditionality is just going to increase further for parents of younger children. Anthony Painter, very quick. Security, value and pride, your last tweeter said, and that's exactly what the basic income supports in work and not. But, but she was saying that too many freebies are handed out. So um, it, It's not more, more freebies in a sense. It's just a different way of running a, a tax and benefit system that supports a, a, a different way of living and working. And very, very quick word from you. Yes, I, th I think a, a lot of people would would respond well to this but even if only a few didn't even if only a few exploited it that would create a big political brouhaha in our oh, present okay. media gonna have to stop you there that's all we've got time for my thanks to dr malcolm torrey of the citizens income trust will hadman hadwin of working families anthony painter director of policy and strategy at the rsa and professor donald hirsch from loughborough university thanks to all for all your calls and emails you can find out more from our website paul lewis is back on saturday with Moneybox. i'm here next wednesday afternoon and that was Leslie Cohen, and the producer was Diane Richardson. Inside Health explores healing, the healing power of exercise. In a moment, that's after we've heard from Sheila Dillon. It's time again for the BBC Food and Farming Awards, and your chance to feed us the facts we need to find Britain's best. The best food producer, local retailer, cook, drinks maker, market, food visionary. Finding those heroes and heroines really matters. They always say, like, we heard about you through Food and Farming Awards. Winning the BBC Food and Farming Award has completely and utterly changed our lives. You know the game changers in your part of the world. Please tell us about them. Find out how you can take part in the 2016 BBC Food and Farming Awards by going to the BBC Radio 4 website. Now, new year, new you and a new series of Inside Health. Here's Dr Mark Porter. Hello, we're back and kicking off the new series with a special programme dedicated to exercise. We all know it's good for us and that most of us should do more, so we've decided to take a lateral approach to the subject. And there's something for everyone, whether you're a keep fit enthusiast or a couch potato. Coming up, arthritis, an exercise why weak muscles rather than damaged joints are behind many aches and pains. 
how many people have difficulty undoing a jar, how many people have difficulty getting out of the chair and have to use their arms when they stand up. They're the group of people we need to get at now and do some muscle strengthening with. And being weak and out of shape doesn't just affect how you feel. It can influence your chances of recovery from serious illnesses like cancer too. There were concerns previously that if you're unwell, you should rest and that will help you recover. But it actually appears to be the contrary, in fact. Movement and exercise and mobilisation early after either surgery for cancer or during treatment can improve your long-term outcome. And we'll be answering this listener's query about overdoing it in the gym. I come to the idea of exercise fairly late in life. How can I push myself without actually killing me? We'll discover how much is too much and how hard you should push yourself later on. But first, an insider's view from our special correspondent, Dr Margaret McCartney, who hasn't let the awful weather we've had recently stop her leading by example. It's pitch dark. It's pouring with rain. In fact, the rain is bouncing off the pavements and there are puddles everywhere. And I'm just going to go out for my... 5k run. I do think I'm slightly crazy actually. Here we go, just got my garment on. 